You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series and syndicating for the A-List Online. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and the interview subjects that I've got coming up for you, they're from a Perth band called Yalla Yalla. You'll be hearing from Dave Watkins on vocals and Tim Watkins who takes care of drums and percussion. The reason for the conversation is to promote the outfit's outstanding brand new EP for 2019. It's called Tides. So let's have a listen to what the lads have to say. Here we go. Hello, mate. How are you? Thanks for the Facebook like, mate. This is uh, yeah, that was Tim. That's... Me and Tim are here. Oh, sweet. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Uh, I know you're bros, but uh, if you live together or whether I should call uh, conference in, but if you're both there, mate, all the better, mate. We can kick things off. Yeah, we lived together for about 25 years, and that was enough. <laughs> I was going to say, mate. Yeah, I, I, God, I think, when was the last time I lived with my brother in the bloody 90s, I think, and that was too soon enough even for living memory, mate, so... <laughs> You know, I don't know how you guys are in a band together. I might as well make that my first question, actually. How, no. how... I think the band started with what guess the sound between the two two walls. Yeah, me and Dave used to share a share a bedroom. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> guess the sound, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I know, yeah, gosh, it's uh it was a bit like that. I remember that too actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> but uh how... I'll just leave you with that. I'm not gonna say any more on that. Like you can just let the mind wander with that. Oh, I will, yeah. mate. Yeah, it'll keep me up at night. I'm sure it'll give me nightmares. All good. <laughs> when you say you remember that, does that mean that mum and dad had cameras in our room and you were watching us? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is that is that to me or to you to each other? No, to you. You said you remember that. Share, me and Dave sharing a room. <laughs> no, no. I remember what it was like when I had a bro and we were sharing a room. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. The bloody problem with omni omni channel telepresent communication is a lot of the detail gets lost. But there you go. But <laughs> so so this is my first question for you, being brothers, and I've asked a few siblings this question and I've it's interesting the responses I get, so here we go. How have you stopped how have you not murdered each other given that you've grown up with each other and now you're in a band with each other? Because I'm a musician, so I get what being in a band is like. It's tough at the best of times, yet alone siblings. I mean, just look at the kinks after 40 years. I think it's maybe even longer about that. I'll just say 40 years. The Davies brothers are finally reconciled in 2018. But how do you guys manage? Uh, you know, every every now and then we might have a share a couple of uh, naughty words, you know, but... um. It's actually really cool, hey. Like me and Dave are really connect really well, like on stage and in the jam room and stuff. But Sorry. yeah, I mean, we've we've always gotten along. I think that's what you know, being being brothers, being having an unconditional relationship. You can just pretty much, you can be as brutal as you as you know as, as you know. We can be brutal with each other, brutally honest. And I think that a lot of a lot of um, bands, um, you know, band band member relationships that that, that can be missing. Like they mm. can be like. Just not like, just this that brutal honesty with with um with you know what, what how how something went in a, in the jam room like how, yeah. how how someone's performing, so yeah I think that that's that you can have that honesty within brothers you have that because we've had commu- like that clear communication we know how to communicate with each other from, yeah you know, we've done it from an early age. Well, a similar partnership to you guys, you might be aware of the Cavalier brothers that used to be in Sepultura. And yeah. and that Dave, uh, sorry, um, Max was the singer and also the guitarist, but for all intents and purposes, he was the singer, a bit like you, Dave. And uh, his brother Igor, it's a bit like you, Tim. He was the uh, the dr- the drum behemoth, one of the best drummers I reckon around. But um, yeah. but they famously had a falling out in nineteen ninety six, and it was it took about. 14 years or so for them to repair that so it doesn't always work out and that's what I was alluding to alluding to before so do you have situations in the dynamic because it's actually an interesting dynamic in that there are a fair few siblings now don't ask me to go and quote them because I won't be able to do it bloody right now as soon as we finish a call I'll be able to do it but the sibling relationship is of course there's brothers but the, the instrument the instrumentational relationship is that one of them's a vocalist and one of them's a drummer so so do you find that that makes it easier given that you're, you're generally standing in centre of stage? So, Dave, you're up the front. Tim, you're up the back there. Is it easier to communicate with each other that way or it's just it doesn't even make a difference? Oh, I mean, um, Dave, Dave, Dave also is one of them bosses that can play everything as well, you know? So, like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Davo, Davo can really, like, amp me up, like... Just, just good, good vibes, hey. And like, 
basically, you have to do something pretty messed up to um, upset me or Dave. Mm-hmm. But at, funny, like, it, we'll probably still find it quite funny. Like, it's just, <laughs> we just <laughs> got a strange, strange sense of humour. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to have it. Hey, man, we really like your sense, your uh, taste in music, man. It's good. Oh, sweet. Okay, yeah, yeah. Look, I've... Um... I interview so many artists, I've actually lost track. I think I'm well over 300, I know that. But, um, yeah, I tend to go from everything, uh, when I say everything, uh, I interview a lot of the bands that come through from Firestarter through um, through Lee. And I've got to tell you yeah. guys, I really like everything that I'm hearing. Your stuff in particular, It's uh, I do like the sort of, and I'm going to call it heavy metal. I hope you guys don't mind me calling it that for the sake of the conversation. But I call mm-hmm. anything... Call it whatever you want. Yeah, it's just great heavy metal at the end of the day, what you guys are doing. and But that's where I come from, really. But it's interesting for me, lads, and that I'm also a musician, as I've mentioned. And I tend to, be, being a bass player, a career bass player, I tend to stick to funk and disco styles in terms of my playing. Yeah. So what I listen to has nothing to do with what I play. Yeah. It's just, but uh, but it, can, it can influence you, eh? Yeah, it's just I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think of how it comes through, but I don't know whether it does. I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, a, a died in the wool fan of bands like Morbid Angel, um, and uh, a lot of death and black metal. And uh, at the same time, I love Village People. <laughs> it's just, I don't know whether I'm. Yeah, the I, I, that listen, does I listen that. to a lot of like reggae, you know, and like, I, I try and put a bit of reggae into my into my drums for Yellow with the heavier stuff. Like I Danny Carey from Tool, he puts a lot of jazz into like. Heavier like music like that, you know. I think that sort of um, influence is important. Like just to have that broad broad range of influences. Like my my influences are ridiculously broad. Like from you know sort of EDM to uh, sort of I'll be I'll play sort of folky rock and roll rockabilly sort of rock and roll. Hmm. So that that sort of stuff that I naturally play if I was to pick up a guitar, it'd be like it's got a little bit of a um, swing to it. But um, for you know, I I can sort of take take my writings without like lyric writings and then bring that to Yella. Um, yep. and I think that's where you get your real original stuff is from just sort of taking the scraps and the bits and pieces that sort of don't make the cut of what you know of what you're, you know from other things. Towards the uh, towards the end of me and Dave living at home with Mum and Dad, every like Saturday or Sunday we used to wake up at eight o'clock every like every morning on the weekend, like with a massive hangover to dad playing Elvis Presley or Dean Martin out the back, like playing his crayfish, you know? So yeah. at that time it was really annoying because he woke us up, but like we listened back to like that music now and we're like, yeah, it's just great. Like, yeah. It seeps in, doesn't it? You can't help it, especially if you're musically, in- well, really particularly if you're musically inclined and you play and you do have an outlet like you do play an instrument and you've taken it one step further, which you lads have done, which is you've got a collective together, i.e. your band, and now you're producing this wonderful music that's on Tides and through this single here, Aquatica. But you, you cannot help but be influenced by things that are played around you, especially in the family environment. Yeah, sure. You just, you, you can't, and, and Tim, you mentioned, I can I can hear those trap beats through your drums too. I've got to compliment you on the drums there too, mate. They're magnificent. I, I, I do... As a bassist, I listen intently to a percussionist performance, and you really know how to lean into the groove. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you. you. Know, and that's that's really important because, dear God, I play with enough drummers that play. You know, they play across the groove. They've got no groove, so they're just sort of skimming across it like an ACDC style thing. Which, I, to be frank with you, I'm as Aussie as as everybody else is. You know, well, you know, I'm I'm Australian, but I just can't stand. Yeah. I can't stand that ACDC groove. I just can't do it. Just a bit jagged, eh? I like a bit of flow and, and a bit of bounce. Yeah, I was talking to Vernon Reed from Living Colour about it, actually, because I Living Colour have got a bit of a um, a renaissance going on. That's that's what I've termed it. And I said, man, I, I love bands like Living Colour and 24-7 Spies, but hardly anybody else has heard of them. Is it the so-called yeah. funk metal or funk rock or whatever it might be called through the popular culture. But, yeah, and the reason I liked a lot of that music was because of the musicianship and the way that those musos could sit in the pocket and really groove but doing heavy music at the same time. And there's heaps, like yeah. you guys are doing it beautifully now. So there's, But back in the day when I was coming through because I'm in my 40s, there was hardly anybody bloody doing it. There was Faith No More, Primus, Living Colour, 24-7 Spies, Fishbone, King's X, they're, they're, they're literally probably the bands. There are probably a few others that I missed, but they were the, the core listenership 
core bands that I listen to and influence me as a musician. But it's so wonderful to hear that with what you guys are doing with Yali, you've really got that that groove down pack because when you're playing live, I bet you see a lot of heads bopping. Yeah, bro. I mean, like me and um, me and Alex Capes, like the bass player, me and Capesy, we we connect really well. And as you're talking about drummers, like I'm the same with bass players. Like I need a, you know, I can either jump into, jump into a jam room with a bass player for the first time and kick straight away like that, or it could take buddy up to a year. You know, yeah. like you don't. Yeah, mm. it's important to have a drummer and a bass player like that. Mm. Almost like uh, make love while you while you're playing. You know, like. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. even if you're not playing as well, whatever you want. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a visceral thing. Though. I know, I know your, your point stands. It's got to be a visceral thing, and people who aren't musicians don't really understand it. But if you're a musician and you get into a rehearsal room, and this is interesting for me, this comment, because I'm a covers musician. That's what I do. I'm going to Biloela, which is in central Queensland, in a couple of days' time for a few gigs in a mining ter- in the mining territories there. But, God, I've turned up to a lot of gigs, man, like I was saying before, where I've these drummers come highly recommended. Uh, even some guitarists, actually a lot of guitarists that must be said, Jesus Christ, they're probably the worst, to be honest. Um, but they come <laughs> highly recommended with a reputation, but they just can't sit in the pocket and can't groove. And it's it's actually physically hard for me to play. You know what I'm saying? You guys can probably understand. It's physically hard to dig in and try to – you almost try to – you almost try to eke out or ca- like carve out a groove so as that people can dance. Yeah, yeah bang on, yeah. Yeah. So the, with your album here, the EP, it's it's an EP, isn't it? Tides. Okay. That's well, whatever you want to call it, really. I mean, if you experience the whole thing, there's really nine tracks on it, you know. Well, that's what I thought. I know I noticed in the Firestarter um, uh, marketing blurb it mentioned it was an EP, but I th- I saw the nine tracks it is too. An EP. It technically is an EP, but I mean, it's it's a release. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And what I like really about it. Go, well, I tell you what I really liked about it. Well, you, you've got these interludes. I want to ask you a question about what the purpose of the interludes were, because I like them as standalone songs. So my question would be, are the interludes extended intros, or are they songs in their own right and under themselves? They're to join the previous track with the... like with, To join one track into another, so the whole whole EP flows. So... Mm. So it all... You, basically, like if you, if you get a good album... I. I we, we tend to think that if if, the, uh, uh, if an artist releases an album like or or an EP or whatever you want to call it, you put it in your player and you can listen to it from start to finish without skipping it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Experience, experience the way that that artist has put them songs in that order to listen to it. So That's... on the hard on the hard copies, the the uh, interludes are actually hidden in like they 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 play in a negative. And then count down into the uh-huh. song. So if you skip tracks, you don't actually experience that interlude. That's interesting, and that leads into my next question, actually, because in this day and age, as you lads well know, people don't buy physical copy; they're streaming. I mean, ninety percent, ninety-five percent of people will be streaming it or finding it on Apple Music or Spotify, wherever. But the point is, they're not buying physical physical copy now. I understand yeah. where you guys are coming from with this. It needs to be listened to in order to take the full effect of what you guys, as the creators intend it needs yeah. to be listened to as a unit but do you think it's going to come across as well when people are going to spotify and it's on a spotify mix for example so just say one of the excellent cuts are isolated and it's presented in a mix with a whole heaps of others a whole heap of other songs that from different artists yeah well, well our intention was to release it on vinyl but it didn't really fit in our budget we're, we're working in the negatives here you know with yeah we're, um, i get it yeah um, yeah so that, that was that was the intention at the start. So. We did have a, we did have a, like the idea. We did toy, we, like our guitarist suggested to us. Are we saying, are we going to call the, are we going to have like an actual name for each interlude? But we didn't want that. We want it to be, it's designed to, to, it's created for that certain song, you know? Mm. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's sort of like, it was a, you know, I think it's, it, um, we, we just encourage people to buy the whole, EP on you know, or listen to the whole EP on Spotify um, and if it shuffles and they hear this great interlude then they're probably going to wonder what it's from and hopefully you know mm. stick onto the EP well I think um, that they're great tracks in their own right 
you know that. Uh, I, I have listened to it a few times and I made a point of listening to each of the interludes as standalone songs and I know that some of them are only a minute long or, or what have you, but still they're, they're nice little sound bites. You know, you're not... The point is is that you're not waiting 30 to 40 seconds for the music to start because you can hear, you know, some people, when they're doing interludes or music to the effect, it takes a long time for the actual music to start. And I it's think... It's just ambient. Yeah. yeah, it's ambient noise. And in this day and age, man, as a, as a as a emerging artist, it's really important that I think you give every, people every opportunity, regardless of what song comes on, that start, it's yeah. actually a technical thing. It's not a musical thing. It's just a technical thing, and it's appealing to people's listening habits. But the song or the music starts fairly quickly, and that's that's what I liked about it. Awesome. <clears throat> have you have you got the actual uh, hard copy? No. Starter, no, they sent me oh, through. Yeah, well, give us your bloody address after the interview, man, and we'll send you for a hardy. Uh, Thank you, man. You know, I do love CDs. I've got to tell you, CDs and vinyl. It's because um, I've got two young daughters. You see, and uh, we call it our morning music, and we put on the morning mm. music, yeah, um, to get them going and ready for school. But uh, yeah, no, that's cool, man. No, that's very kind, and I appreciate that. So, um, and the the other thing about the the sound, it's got a crystal clear production. It's a sort of production that, say, fifteen years ago, would have cost millions of dollars to to obtain, I believe. So, who who did you record it with, and where did you record it? Well, this didn't quite cost. It was uh, like nine hundred ninety nine thousand. It was just under a million. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, Troy Navaban, uh, but I'll let Dave talk about Troy because um, he's just he's just a genius. Hey, well, he's he's um I, I studied with Troy at Whopper, and um, he. Troy sort of, um, you know, the second. This is the second time we recorded it with him, and he said, uh, "This time around, I can do you the. I can get you a better sound than what we had last time, and it's at a fraction of the cost. Like we're basically mixing in the box, if you know what I mean by that. Like basically, for the listeners at home, means like mixing on a, a digital audio workstation. So just basically inside a computer. Mm. So you basically you home studio, digital um, studio, but um, with a summing bus." Of the con of a SSL console, mm -hmm. so where that's we learned that that's that's where the sound, um, the sound of those large consoles, these uh, popular SSL need consoles, it, it's within the summing bus. So mm -hmm. it came out of it came out of that digital work, workstation, and you know, which with all the flexibility of like you know of of Pro Tools, and that's what we recorded on Pro Tools. Yeah. So all the flexibility of these are of like working in a digital order work, <coughs> workstation, like automation effects and stuff like that. So putting like delay on one word, um, and then he uh, and having everything sort of saved and um, recallable, uh, and then basically just being able to mix down through this analog summing bus. Mm. So having the best of both worlds. Okay. So that, yeah. that's how it's really sort of, he 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 recorded our first EP, uh, sending yourself, um, three years ago and. We've like, we've had so much positive feedback from that EP. Some people saying that it's the best sounding EP that's coming out of Perth or whatever. But mm. I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna say that because we've had some really good EPs ourselves. But when we had our, the meeting with him, like to talk about recording tides, I just said, "Look, man, we've got a we've we've got a standard like a, a standard to meet now. Like, we needs to be like as good quality as, as sending yourself. And he goes, bro, it's going to be better. And I said, all right, walk away. Like, and mm. we said, we said, we just like, you tell us what you want. So like, we, we gave him more control because he did such a good job in the, um, with the first release. So. It sounds like, yeah, I've, I've done a number of recording projects and I've done a number of recording projects in studio where, where, and I've been a bass player, I just sort of turn up and play, you know, you guys know how it is when you're, uh, you know, I would never call myself a session musician, but I'm just the guy there to play bass. So I don't have an opinion. I just turn up and play. Yep. But holy moly, have I seen some Barneys happen between the the engineer, the recording engineer, and or the producer and the person whose band it is because it's not a cohesive environment. And to the point where each of the recordings that I've been associated with where the relationship in studio has gone south the end result suffers terribly. And this is um, the last time I was in the studio was like 2010 or 11. So it's a couple, a couple of years ago now, but I did a lot of it through the early two thousands where people were spending a lot of money in studio still. It wasn't like it is in 2018 where you can get things up to a certain point and then even email them over and put them in the cloud and send them over to the U S or wherever it might be to get someone to clean it up for you. But it's wonderful to hear 
that it was a cohesive environment that, that you found for yourselves and you found a partner in crime who sounds like as though they almost became an extra member for the period of time that you guys were doing the recording. Oh, he's, he's part of the band, mate. He's a sixth member. Like he puts mm. his own, he's put put his own like little like bits and pieces like extra guitar lines and stuff in, and he'll give us the mix, and we'll be like, I don't remember recording that. And he goes, Oh, yeah, I did that. Oh. We're like, Yeah, <laughs> boy, that's awesome. That's wicked. So, let's. How far do you want to take this? It's not not such an obvious question, really, because of course you've got the limitations bound by marketing budget and whether or not you've got day jobs and the like, but. If you could take it to North America, Europe, and the world, would you do that? Oh, no. Like, we we we're treating this as a, as a job. Like, we we this is it is important to us. We really we want to go as far as we can, and we go we want to go yeah. where wherever we can. I reckon. I, I, was, I reckon WA is the hotbed, or Perth specifically is the hotbed of Australian music at the moment. And a lot of the music would go really well over here in Queensland, Sunshine Coast and Gold Coast in particular. So, have you got plans to come over here and perform? Yeah, we definitely, definitely do. We're we're actually we're in the middle of organising a uh, down south uh, Western Australia regional tour, yeah. and then because uh, we actually haven't spent much time down there, but um, once we once we've done that, we'll start getting into uh, planning our East Coast um, run. I'd love to build up all the contacts through his uh, touring with Morty's brothers and um, hmm. yeah, all that. So hmm. yeah, we um, yeah, we're, uh, no. we're, we're working on that. No, fair enough. And and talking about uh, the the biggest challenge through the recording, what would you say? What it was that it was? Um, Dave. Um, just not not going in with us, not having a big night before he went into the studio to do his vocal session. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that only happened once. But <laughs> just like basically uh, two days before each vocal session, I tied Dave up in my shed and then I <laughs> I put him in the back of the car and we I took him up to the studio, still tied up. Yep. <laughs> and then um, brought him into Troy and Troy said thank you and then Troy untied him and then he um, performed really well. Yeah. Now, uh, Dave, without suggesting for a moment that you mimic the behaviour of Vince Neil at all from Motley Crue, but I remember reading in The Dirt, you know, that, that famous book by the members of Motley Crue where Vince Neil, through the through their height, so, you know, they only had a couple of albums, a couple of really good albums, but through their height, they called it the window of opportunity and it was somewhere between five beers and eight beers and that's all they had in studio with Vince Neil. You just cut it out a little bit there. Sorry, bro. Oh, sorry, yeah. Talking about Vince Neil in studio, I don't want to. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably get it wrong, but it's to the effect of the story's roundabout uh, correct anyway. Vince Neil only had the recording opportunity to get his vocal bang on was between five beers and eight beers. So if you got him after the fifth beer <laughs> and before the eighth beer, you were okay. But that was probably only about twenty minutes or so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like. Super, I'll be have like fisherman's friends on board, like herbal tea, just to make you know, like make sure my voice is just spot on. I'm very sober in the studio. Um, yeah, I that's that's but yeah, that's the way I operate. Yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, yeah. I know yeah, it's... I exaggerated that. Like they like except the tying up bit. That's just happened. But, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, sweet. Yeah. Well, it's it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because. The studio sorts, whether it's a studio, just recording things to a console for the purposes of a professional release, something that you want other people to listen to. Either My experience has been people either can do it or they can't do it. Now, some very good musicians who can perform well live have been known to crumble under the weight and expectation of what happens, I'll just say in the studio, but you know what I'm talking about, recording for the purposes yeah. of releasing a professional professional release. So that wasn't an issue for you guys at all? Everybody handled their own parts professionally and effectively? Yeah, I did a um, – because I, 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 I put the drums down first and um, I probably – I think we did – because the, the studio that we, tra we tracked the drums in, crank, crank recording in Perth, it's quite expensive per session and hmm. – Troy let us look, Troy let us do a, uh, a fifteen hour session for it, and um, towards the end, I was just I was really like, toward, like maybe the last two tracks, I was just struggling hard. But Troy was just like, "Nah, just don't be shit, him. Like you know, you'd be right. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> it, was, it was good. Like 
like he was um he was very very picky on like very hard on me but i i like that because um the stage that i'm at like you know as as a musician i I want people to tell me that i'm shit so i can improve you know Mm. if something someone doesn't like something let me know you know Mm. and with recording vocals troy he kind of he knew my voice but um we did this you know the, the second time around he um he kind of just went he just knew how to sort of coach me and coach me through it you know like just through certain takes yeah and um we even even actually wrote lyrics with me like yeah like i just sort of, i know like I've, I've i've even lived with troy at uni so it was sort of sat down sat down and i just said i can't i can't get this line the meaning of this song i just there's one line i just need to nail just to like make it complete and um yeah we sat we sat down with this and we you know so like as far as from even from writing lyrics um, um, I feel really comfortable with Troy. So yeah, it was just, it was really good process. And like what you were saying earlier, um, Andrew, about have like um, musos having like uh, Barney's with engineers and stuff, but mm. it wasn't that bad. But through Dave's first vocal session with our first our first single, uh, not ordinary, Troy was telling Dave, he's going, Dave, can you? I want you to pronounce not ordinary with ordinary. And Dave's going, no, it's not going to work. Then Troy's just, just do it, Dave. And then we did it, and it worked. Like, yeah, there you go. Yeah, the trust yeah. there. Yeah, there's a the trust there. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And I, I've got, I've got that trust. I'm like, yeah, okay. But when I, you know, we did it, and it just, it, it, it just came through well. And cut, cut through the mix. Mm, indeed, yeah. yeah. Well, definitely, you can tell. And look, unfortunately, lads, I'm going to have to wrap things up because I've got to keep trucking on to the next one, which is at 8.30. But um, before I let you go, um, you've obviously got a Facebook page, but how else can people tune into this wonderful release? Because I understand that uh, Tides is due to be released on the 11th of January, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's released, uh, released on the 11th of January on, on, like, um, so on all online music stores, but then our release, our actually actual launch date is on the 19th of January at Jackrabbit Slams in the city. Okay, sweet. All right. So um, yeah. it's interesting because most of my audience is in the United States. So I think that yeah. it's interesting for them to hear about all these local venues in far-flung places such as Perth. Because um, we're so used to hearing about it on the other side, aren't we, as Australians, all these places like CBGBs in New York. It's a nice change for once for people on the other side of the world who we're used to hearing about stuff that's to do with their culture, hear about ours. So that's a cool reference. Yeah, reference. it's interesting to know what, you know, if your listeners could comment on this chat, on this po- um, post, um, in this chat, on this podcast, um, you'd be go. interested to know what radio stations we go down well with on um on um, you know, just certain college radio stations or something. Indeed, yeah, you uh, heard. Yeah, that'd be great. If anybody okay. listening can do that, that'd be wonderful. I reckon out of like all your listeners, I reckon there might be like one or two Americans that are coming to Perth. They'll be in Perth <laughs> on January 19th and they should come to our show. They should, definitely. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> all right, lads. You have been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series and syndicating for the A-List Online. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and that conversation featured Dave and Tim Watkins from the epic Perth outfit, Yalla Yalla. Thank you so much for listening.